Blair's government as foreign policy and defense advisor uh, and as the head of the cabinet of office defense and overseas secretariat. And under Tony Blair, he demonstrated uh, as well his powers as a negotiator in contacts with Iran, which led to the liberation of 15 British sailors and Marines. That was spring of 2007. Around the time uh, Ambassador was appointed to become His Majesty's envoy uh, to uh, His Majesty's Airport to Washington, the Times of London ran a story assessing the qualities he would bring to this position. Regarding his uh, tenacity and forcefulness, the Times quoted some who spoke of him as a Rottweiler, but it also underlined that others spoke of him as a pussycat. So a, a, a diplomat we have here who grasps both hard and power, and I think that makes him a perfect envoy to deal with the new world at this particularly vexing moment of its history. I think it's especially notable qualities to move us all beyond that infamous dichotomy formulated at the time of the Iraq War, which had the United States as Mars and Europe as Venus. We are, we are particularly eager today to hear Ambassador Scheinberg uh, because he has chosen uh, for this occasion uh, to use Columbia as a forum to set out uh, his government's uh, policy on counterterrorism, and we welcome you very much. We'll uh, have the, the questions at the end, which address both the talk and other, other questions that are related to it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, as you said, what I'd, what I'd like to do really is concentrate on, um, on our overall approach to counterterrorism policy. But in the Q&A afterwards, uh, it's free for all, and um, we'll have to talk about wider, wider aspects of, of foreign policy when we get on to, when we get on to that. Um, I'm delighted to be here. As you say, it's actually my second visit to the university, but my first I came here about a year ago uh, to meet, uh, meet uh, President Bollinger. Uh, just, just after his encounter with uh, the Iranian president. Um, and um, uh, but this is my first time I've been invited to make a speech. So thank you very much for inviting me. Um, and it's a great pleasure to be here. You're one of the uh, oldest, most distinguished universities in the world. Um, and uh, I'm delighted to be here. And I'm delighted there are so many links with the UK, including with our uh, also distinguished school, the London School of Economics. And it's one of your uh, institutional links, which uh, we're certainly very proud of. What I want to do is uh, explore the threat from international terrorism um, faced by the UK and the US and our respective responses to it. It's a threat that's um, both complex and serious and whose awful consequences people in this city, uh, in London and many other cities around the world have unfortunately experienced uh, firsthand in recent years. Um, I'm going to try and set out the strategy which the UK has adopted uh, within our own uh, legal and democratic framework to protect our citizens and reduce violent extremism in our communities uh, and, um, and talk a little bit about the external um, elements as well. Now at the moment, neither the US nor Britain face a single threat to um, our national security from one country. We face instead a range of challenges. And some of these, uh, the consequences of failed or failing states, or the potential use of uh, weapons of mass destruction, they're not new. Uh, in some shape or form, they've been issues of great um, and pressing uh, importance uh, to both our countries uh, throughout the last century. But others, such as the impact of um, transnational organized crime or the effects of climate change, uh, are more recent, or at least more recent in terms of our treatment uh, of the recognition of them. And these are addressed in the UK's national security strategy, which was um, adopted earlier this year. That strategy, that document, um, does not classify terrorism as a, as a strategic threat uh, to the nation, and that's important. Uh, Lawrence Friedman, one of our most distinguished scholars of strategic studies, said, terrorism is traditionally the strategy of the weak against the strong. Uh, and uh, our belief, my government's belief, is that our posture should therefore be one of what I would call strategic confidence, um, that the terrorists cannot and will not win, while at the same time um, we can show that we are 
uh, serious about meeting the uh, practical and tactical challenges of dealing with indiscriminate and unconventional threats which terrorism poses. Now, we rightly talk a great deal about the unique cooperation between our two countries in tackling terrorist threats. But the threats we face, UK and US, are in fact a little different. The threat to the UK comes from individuals who live and work in our cities, as well as from people who are external, who wish to travel to our country and attack us. And some of these people are, of course, British. While those who uh, perpetrated the 9-11 atrocities here were foreigners who'd infiltrated American society, the suicide bombers who killed 52 people um, in the London transport system in July 2005 were British citizens living and working amongst us. So the current threat comes not only from Al-Qaeda and its franchises around the world, uh, but from a diverse range of terrorist organizations that sympathize with Al-Qaeda's single narrative. And they accuse the West and what they call illegitimate regimes in the Muslim world of being anti-Islamic, and they're prepared to carry out indiscriminate acts of extreme violence without warning. That's not a threat we've had to face from international terrorism before. In the 70s and 80s, terrorism was often linked to the Palestinian cause and often uh, state-sponsored. Terrorists came into our country from outside, and international terrorism was perceived as an external threat to the people of the UK. Uh, of course, at the same time, we did have to deal with the domestic threat from Irish-related terrorism. I think it's fair to say that in this country, you don't have a challenge of quite that kind. Indeed, you still rightly and understandably think of international terrorism as we used to, as something out there and not right here, and your response is uh, targeted accordingly. Now, in countries like the UK and US, where law enforcement and intelligence agencies have managed to disrupt attacks and attempted attacks, it's sometimes hard to explain to people the scale and the urgency of the threat we face. But no one should take the absence of attack to mean the absence of threat, nor indeed to mean that the absence of success in containing that threat. Consider, for example, the number of convictions for terrorist offences since the beginning of last year in the UK. That's 81 people found guilty as a result, <coughs> excuse me, as a result of 23 different operations. And overall, nearly half of those people pleaded guilty. Now, that's a significant increase on previous years and decades, and it shows very clearly why those who argue that the uh, UK government and others exaggerate the scale of the terrorist threat are wrong. Now, why are we under attack? Uh, what are the radicalizing factors that make individuals commit uh, murder and other crimes? And what are their goals? The focus of those who threaten us today is not a cause related to a specific geographical area. Al-Qaeda wants to overthrow the governments of many Muslim countries and to impose on them a new social, political, and economic structure, establishing their distorted version of what they call true Islamic societies. Afghanistan under the Taliban gives an indication of what this would be like. They also want to change the way that we relate to the Islamic world. For them, there can be no meeting of minds between the Islamic and non-Islamic worlds, uh, or even among Muslims who express, who express different outlooks and opinions. What Al-Qaeda wants and what its actions aim to foment is a state of relentless hostility and confrontation between all people. But growing numbers of people around the world are now seeing Al-Qaeda for what it really stands for and expressing their revulsion to it. And Muslims are leading the response. Their communities have suffered more than most. In the UK, for example, we've seen the formation of the Quillam Foundation, a think tank created by former extremists. Uh, in Iraq, as you know, Muslim communities, Sunni and Shia, working with the Iraqi authorities, have risen against the brutal reality of repeated Al-Qaeda attacks and removed its presence in many areas. In Pakistan, there's a growing resistance too following recent atrocities, for example, the bombing of the Marriott Hotel uh, and attacks in the tribal belt. Furthermore, religious opposition to Al-Qaeda's uh, distorted interpretation of Islam is also growing. In the last year, a number of former extremists have made high-profile recantations, and numerous clerics and institutions have come out against the ideological underpinnings which are used by Al-Qaeda. Uh, Dr. Fadl, a former leader of the uh, Egyptian Islamic Jihad and a mentor to Zawahari, the uh, number two in Al-Qaeda, 
released a series of articles at the beginning of the year from his cell in Cairo in which he argued that, and I'm quoting, there is no such thing in jihad as ends justifying the means and that nothing invokes the anger of God and his wrath like the unwarranted spilling of blood. In the autumn of 2007, the leading Saudi scholar Salman al-Ahda, a man that Osama bin Laden once called the only sincere scholar in Saudi Arabia, issued an open letter to the al-Qaeda leader calling him to account for the wars and bloodshed spilled in the name of al-Qaeda. Now these and other efforts deserve our encouragement and our support. Now as we look at the response to the threat, we've all had to change, we've all had to scale up our response to the threats that we're facing. Because the threat in the UK is one in our own cities and among our own people, we need um, a targeted and a comprehensive approach. Of course we use our military and our intelligence relationships and assets, and we rely on the police and we rely on our law enforcement agencies to arrest and prosecute offenders at home. But we've had to do much more than that. We've strengthened our legislation and we've had to devise non-legislative me measures such as control orders uh, to deal with the problem. We've had to take unprecedented measures to protect the law-abiding majority from a tiny but dangerous minority. And we've had some very difficult public debates and parliamentary debates on these subjects and on the balance between the rights of the individual on the one hand and collective security on the other. One of the strengths of the UK system is that it's very clear in our um, political and parliamentary system who leads the domestic counter-terrorism effort, and that is the Home Secretary, now Jackie Smith, to whom both the police and our security service are accountable. While it's still the case that the Home Secretary leads our response to terrorism, it's no longer true that it's an issue only for her and for the security <coughs> professionals around her alone. This recognition that it's the whole of government and many non-governmental partners beyond that need to be engaged in tackling the terrorist threat has led in our country to the creation of a new office for security and counterterrorism based in our home office, which is developing and implementing our national counterterrorism strategy, not only across the whole of government, but also internationally. And that uh, new office, that OSCT, is roughly comparable to your National Counterterrorism uh, Center, NCTC. And it's no co coincidence that both our countries have had to set up organizations devoted to the complexity of strategic planning in this area in recent years. Um, our strategy covers four basic areas. Uh, prevent, uh, four Ps, prevent, preventing terrorism by tackling the radicalization of individuals, pursuing terrorists and those that sponsor, that sponsor them, protecting the public, key national services and our interests overseas, and preparing for the consequences of an attack. So prevent, pursue, protect, prepare. The protect pillar aims to reduce um, the vulnerability of the UK and our interests overseas to terrorist attacks. So it focuses on a number of areas, such as places where people gather, our critical national infrastructure, uh, the transport system, and so on. And that includes strengthening our borders. We've got a new borders agency, and that's been working with the police and others to strengthen our borders and to control them better than before. And that effort has been underpinned by the rollout of a major new automated system to check passenger movements in advance of travel. We're also stepping up our engagement with industry. Uh, we're a world leader in security and defense technologies, for example, airport screening technology, and we have on our doorstep great expertise and creativity in that area. We're doing a lot of that work in conjunction with people in this country. The prepare strand of contest, uh, the counterterrorism strategy, ensures that if there, um, if there is uh, another successful terrorist attack in our country, we're as well prepared as we can be for it, and that all the relevant agencies will be able to respond in a rapid and effective way, save lives and reduce harm to the uh, environment and to property. Uh, and that's why we've been, among other things, building up our resilience to attack from uh, chemical, biological, or radiological weapons. Now I'm going to say a bit more about the next uh, of the Ps, which is pursue. Since 9-11, um, we've put far greater resources into the pursuit and disruption of terrorist activity. That's the pursue strand. 
and by 2011, the amount of money being invested in this area will have doubled to about uh, £3.5 billion. This has allowed us to increase the size of our security service and the number of police involved in countering violent extremism. We're also regionalizing our CT effort in the way we've never done before, with four regional counterterrorism policing hubs in London, Manchester, Birmingham, and in Leeds, and a fifth is on the way. And these units extend our reach and allow us to connect um, uh, very clearly to the wider capabilities of our police forces. We've strengthened our counterterrorism legislation in response to the evolving threat. So in 2006, um, training and preparing to commit terrorist acts and encouraging others to do so all became criminal offences in the UK, so widening the, uh, the definition of terrorist activity. And we're currently legislating to allow, to allow post-charge questioning and improved information sharing in a new uh, Act of Parliament. The international nature of this threat means that we also depend, as never before, on other states for intelligence and for cooperation. And a key element of our strategy, therefore, is to strengthen that cooperation with countries like Pakistan, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and others. Um, uh, continuing our good cooperation um, with the United States, our closest ally is absolutely vital too. And that goes for um, daily exchanges between our agencies, to good relationships between our um, large government departments, between our Home Office, for example, and your Department for Homeland Security. And there's a huge amount of work going on overseas in difficult environments such as Iraq uh, and Afghanistan. Um, now I'm going to move on to the final of these, uh, of these elements of our strategy, prevent, defeating terrorism in the long term. Um, pursuing terrorists, protecting our national infrastructure, and preparing for the consequences of an attack are essential to security. But we are clear, we cannot arrest our way out of this threat, and we need to focus our efforts also on stopping the next generation becoming terrorists or supporting violent extremism. We have a growing body of knowledge about the radicalization process from case histories of those who've attempted or perpetrated terrorist acts. And it's clear there's no single profile of a violent extremist or a single radicalization pathway. But there are factors and vulnerabilities which repeatedly appear and which can leave a person more susceptible to exploitation by extremists. And these include the power of the global extremist ideology to link personal problems to global issues, the promise of reward, and renown, or the psychological and emotional benefits of belonging, which is what um, uh, involvement in an extremist organization can sometimes seem to provide. All of these factors might result from a sense of isolation and exposure to a, a, a traumatic event, uh, or some significant change in a person's personal circumstances. And we all know the speed with which uh, someone can succumb and can become an active proponent of this violent uh, extremist ideology. Now, there's no overnight solution or quick way of dealing with this very complex challenge of preventing people becoming um, extremists and ultimately um, terrorists. But our strategy, the, the prevent strand of our, um, of our approach, um, is firmly underway in many parts of the UK and draws in central government, our local government, the police, and of course, the communities themselves. And our delivery plan has five key objectives. Most of these are relevant to our work overseas as well as in the UK. The first is to counter or challenge the ideology of violent extremism and support mainstream Muslim voices, especially among our youth, to expose the weaknesses of Al-Qaeda's narrative and to reaffirm our commitment to universally shared values. So from prisons to colleges, from the internet to sports clubs, Violent extremists are actively on the lookout for those who may be open to approaches, and thankfully, most of our youth don't succumb, but a tiny minority do. So our second objective has got to be to disrupt those um, who are trying to do, to trying to uh, effect this radicalization through actions like prosecution and exclusion from the uh, UK, um, and to um, and to work 
uh, with partners to strengthen the institutions that they exploit. Earlier this month, for example, our Department for Children, for Schools and Families issued advice for teachers on how to deal with the signs of radicalization. We know that personal circumstances and individual life experiences can be used by violent extremists to draw people into terrorism. As recent examples have shown, vulnerable young individuals can be exploited and recruited, and supporting them is the third objective of our strategy. Because violent extremism will thrive in communities where there is, if not overt support, then at least tacit support through lack of challenge of extremists, our fourth objective is to increase the capacity of our communities to resist these extremist messages. It's strong communities themselves that are going to be the most effective and credible institutions in stopping radicalization. This work includes government support and funding for partnerships of this kind with um, communities, with local government and the voluntary sector, and working with Muslim faith leaders to equip them with the skills to engage with young people and tackle this ideology. And our fifth objective is to address real and perceived grievances on emotive issues like uh, regional and international conflicts and world poverty, which can be exploited by uh, extremists in our society. So we're working to understand and solve um, those we can and to educate people about those which are based on misunderstandings or mistruths, and they're sometimes willfully spread, and to explain better our position on those issues where no change in our basic position is possible. Now, some in the Muslim community uh, have strong views on issues like Iraq and the Middle East peace process. And we have to, in the UK, divide, uh, decide our policy according to the broad national interest, not uh, just one group's view. But we can and do listen and try to explain our position better. Uh, and we have to accept that failure by governments and international bodies to resolve a long-standing conflict like that between Israel and its neighbours does create disillusionment and even despair in the Muslim world. No issue has the capacity to transform attitudes to the West in the Muslim world like the Middle East peace process. The Arab-Israel conflict doesn't in any way excuse or justify a resort to violence, but progress and hopefully a settlement of that issue would be the best single way in the current international conjuncture to expose the extremist lies about us and to show that the path of negotiation and of dialogue can yield results. As I said earlier, the nature of global movements of people and information means much of our prevent work is necessary overseas too. So in the UK, our Foreign Office is heavily engaged in delivering projects overseas to help reduce the threat. And we have for years been providing financial and practical support to less developed countries. That continues and has been massively increased but we're also looking at more directly. Um, so we're also looking more directly at addressing violent extremism, for example, by identifying moderate voices overseas that can challenge the single narrative of Al Qaeda that I've been talking about. So, in Pakistan, for example, we've been sharing lessons um, we've been learning in the UK and assisting in developing their capacity for counterterrorism efforts. And we've been taking British Muslims overseas, enabling them to, to travel, to provide them with a platform to challenge misconceptions about the reality of life for Muslims in Britain. Now, a key ingredient for success in undermining uh, the narrative I've been talking about is to make sure that we use the right language in describing and addressing international terrorism. We've listened to what our Muslim population in the UK um, and overseas have told us, about the way that we've been communicating with them. And we've recently created a research, information and communications unit with, um, in our government which seeks to uh, ensure that both our domestic and overseas communication supports rather than hinders our overall counterterrorism effort and that it counters rather than fuels the terrorist narrative and helps to build cooperation between all sections of society at home and abroad who oppose the actions of violent extremists. Now, this isn't just um, semantics. It's not political correctness. Uh, and it's not being afraid to, um, to talk about the situation as we see it. But it does reflect the impact um, that language and phrases we use can have on our communities and on a wider audience. And we need to remember that uh, Al-Qaeda and other 
violent extremists are themselves very, very careful with the words they use, and they've developed a very slick media strategy to justify their actions and exploit grievances with re which resonate with individuals, which manipulate uh, theology as well as history in contemporary politics. So in the UK, we therefore have adjusted the language that we use. We try to stress the criminality rather than the faith of those involved in terrorism. We've reminded people that all sections of society are affected and that ultimately, therefore, all of us has a stake, has a role in tackling the threat. And while we have to acknowledge the ideological element in Al-Qaeda's campaign, as I said earlier, we should express confidence and optimism that we can confront and defeat them in the battle of ideas. Uh, the government um, and all of us believe that we have to make clear that we reject the, the extremist claim that somehow Islam and the West are incompatible. So, in conclusion, I hope it's clear from what I've said today uh, that terrorism's changed. We have to continue to change and to adapt uh, with it um, as we defend our liberties and our security. Um, and no one country can counter this threat alone. We need close cooperation with our international partners, and in this, the United States remains the UK's number one partner. We work with you more intensely than with anyone else on all aspects of counterterrorism, from intelligence sharing to work on science and other capabilities, um, to talking about our messaging, to joint work overseas in countries which concern both of us. And it's absolutely essential to my country's security, and I believe yours, that that uh, cooperation continues. Now today I've given an overview of my government's uh, response to the increased and changed terrorist threat. Um, and I've done that in a way which I hope shows that we recognize that although that threat is severe and ideological in nature, it does not represent a strategic threat to our societies and way of life, that we recognize it will require new partners in government, in communities, and internationally, and finally, uh, that we recognize that it will require a long-term campaign to turn things around and to reduce the extremism and violence which unfortunately we see in our societies at the moment. So with that, I'd like to close and uh, welcome, welcome questions, I say, on, uh, on anything you'd like to discuss. Thank you very much indeed. It's open to questions, and let me handle them and refer them immediately to the ambassador. <coughs> questions? Um, my name is Alice Labrie. I'm a former U.S. Department of State Foreign Service in Turkey, Oman, Sweden, and I contract the U.S. mission to the U.N. under Richard Holbrook and John A. Conte. I say that in my practice. And I also live in Harlem. You, you use the phrase, um, you know, legally identified methods. I'm a big fan of cameras on the street, which is a sensitive matter, of course, in my community. But I wonder if you might talk a little bit about, you know, the use of uh, particularly cameras, which I'm a big fan of. Well, it's grown up enormously in the UK um, over a long period of time. It probably goes back to um, the period where we were trying to deal with uh, the threat of terrorism from the IRA, and it goes back probably 20 years or so. Uh, in the UK, um, but it's not just terrorism. We also use it to, um, to stop speeding uh, much more than you do here. So you'll find cameras much more prevalent uh, in our cities, but actually well beyond our cities in the UK. Um, and it's become a really important tool, uh, not, just for, um, not just for terrorism, as I say, but also for you know, child trafficking, for, for all sorts of, you know, all, ordinarily, I would say, non-politically inspired violent crime in the UK, using cameras in all sorts of shopping centers, using, uh, using cameras which is in the streets. It has been hugely useful in the terrorist incidents which we've had, unfortunately, in two of the past um, uh, three years in the UK, where you'll probably remember seeing grainy shots of people moving across station, for, you know, um, mm. station concourses, which provide the first identity to the um, to, the, to the police and to our investigating authorities as to who they're dealing with, and they you know, often work from there. So it has been a very important tool. 
and it's being widely shared with and emulated by quite a lot of our partners uh, in Europe and around the world. There's a lot of interest in the way that that network of cameras has, um, has, uh, has, has um, helped people in the UK. It's not without controversy, as you were, as you were saying. Uh, there is a debate about it. Some, some of our civil liberties groups um, do worry about it. But I think, I think I would say that the majority view in the UK, I think I'm safe in saying this, the majority view would be that, um, you know, that while it's you know, in, in some ways regrettable that we, that we have to do this, nevertheless, that, you know, it's a proportionate way of handling the threats that we're facing at the moment um, and, uh, uh, and re- relatively unobtrusive compared with the other, the other issues which I mentioned, which do raise civil liberties issues. Well, just to follow up on that, as you well know, in this country, a Bill of Rights and the Fourth Amendment, which in fact originated from the experience of when we were labeled as terrorists during the Revolutionary War by, by Britain, was against unreasonable search and seizure. So the whole question of CCTVs is one that is, you know, I'm, I'm well aware of the debate in England, and I'm sure I know there will be a heated debate here in New York when this happens. Uh, so I just wanted to comment on that because, you know, we have different traditions. And Lord knows if another attack occurs, the Bill of Rights will go further out of the door here. My question really is on the global strategy. My problem since 911 has been when one looks at the Islamic world and sees its response in the 19th century to Western imperialism and colonialism, there always was a jihadist response in West Africa, East Africa, in, in Southeast Asia. There always was this now called a global response to globalization. And I've always been very critical of the fact that what has not accompanied our response since 911 is something like a Marshall Plan, not to say, and now it is even more problematic in the financial crisis and what that will do on governments. And I wonder what you would say to that, because if you know we take David Kilcullen's sort of argumentation that this is a global counterinsurgency, mm-hmm. well then one of the things you have to do to change the, the equation is to deal with the real dilemmas of social inequalities in these Islamic countries, which doesn't seem to be addressed. In fact, is something that the West benefits from, i.e. the whole manifestation in Egypt of, uh, of what we saw, or Algeria, or other countries. So how, how, how do we grapple with this now, since we may very well have a different approach, mm-hmm. hopefully, mm-hmm. in a week, coming in, but it may not be that different? Well, you've raised some very difficult questions. I, I don't pretend to have, the, uh, to have the answers to them. Um, the first thing to say is that to my mind, at least, there isn't an easy correlation between poverty and extremism either. If you look around the world, um, the poorest continent, Africa, um, you know, has um, has been the source of some terrorism um, in the uh, east of Africa and so on. But I mean, but but by and large, by and large, um, you know, terrorism has you know, has not been particularly spawned by the appalling conditions of poverty over over much of Africa. So it isn't poverty alone. It isn't. It isn't. Um, it isn't low levels of uh, individuals' livelihoods or the or the prevalence of disease, um, uh, which uh, which explains this. You look at India, you know, with uh, 300, 400 million poor. Um, you know, it, is, it, it isn't a it isn't an easy issue to to say that the social conditions conditions of poverty create this. Um, but broadly speaking, I wouldn't disagree with you mm-hmm. that. Um, you need to try to confront this on a number of different levels. And one of them certainly is to, if there are some pockets in some parts of the world where a mixture of things causes this phenomenon to exist, and one of them is poverty, then certainly you've got to try and act on that. That's why I was saying for the UK, um, you know, we spent uh, a, lot, a lot of our uh, government income in the last few years um, raising the amount of international aid which we, which we send out. We do that on the basis of poverty. But, for example, a country like Pakistan, um, we've tripled our aid to, uh, to Pakistan uh, deliberately because there's a, there is a, um, an obvious uh, double requirement for us to reduce poverty, but also to uh, reduce extremism and reduce the threat to my country, uh, from, uh, which comes from Pakistan at the moment. So we, we recognize that it's one of the things that you, that you have to do. I certainly agree with you that, um, um, that um, looking at the world as a whole and um, increasing the effectiveness of multilateral uh, networks and instruments and pressing, for example, for a world trade round to the conclusion of the Doha development round, which was, if you remember, the reason it started uh, a little bit delayed was very much because we felt after 9-11 
uh, all of our governments felt it was important to, uh, to, to restart it, to restart the trade round after the, um, the problems which had taken place, I think, in Seattle initially, um, and then um, um, and to move on and to create a, um, a, a trade-boosting uh, conclusion to that round, which is another, another dent in the, um, in the, uh, the armory of, um, of those who are opposing us on this. So I think there's something in it, but I don't think it's a, maybe quite as, quite as straightforward a, um, uh, a sort of link-up as I, I think you were implying. Thank you. Um, it, 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 yeah, yes, and then I'll start choosing. Yes, go ahead. Mr. Ambassador, you mentioned you saw a link between the situation in the Middle East and the threats of terrorism on British soil. My question is, do you think um, that the terror uh, attacks in England can uh, influence the foreign policy of England towards the Middle East, meaning the more threatened the British population would feel, this might translate into a different policy and what uh, the British foreign policy sees as a solution to the Middle Eastern problem? Well, as I said, I, I don't think we can. Um, I don't think we can change our policy um, because of a, a single a single group. But I mean, the first task for us is to explain better to our Muslim community in the UK uh, what we're actually doing in relation to the Middle East. Because I think if you read some of the, the stuff on the websites, um, you know, you might form the impression that the UK was a uh, an uncritical supporter uh, of Israel was indifferent to the position of, uh, of the Palestinians, had been inactive and, um, and uh, indolent on the subject, and that, that is completely untrue. And I, you know, in my last job, when I was working for our Prime Minister, uh, did spend some time talking to uh, some of the Muslim organizations in the UK, and meeting um, uh, young Muslim leaders in particular, to try to go through this in more, uh, in more detail with them, because I think that a lot of what we're doing now um, is, um, is uh, you know, can, can very, very rapidly, very easily be, um, uh, be misunderstood. Um, so I don't think it will change simply because of pressure from you know, what, what remains a relatively small minority in the UK, but an important one. And uh, we, we know that we need to have a, a much better and stronger dialogue with, with uh, people on that. We need to know uh, whether there are things we can help with. Um, uh, but more than anything else, what it propels us to do even more um, actively than before, um, is to make clear the centrality of this issue for um, the prospects of um, stability and peace and justice in the Middle East, and that's what my government regards as an absolutely fundamental proposition of foreign policy, um, and uh, not to give up on that, and so to press, um, for example, you know, when, when you have a new administration um, uh, after the election next week, one of the things that we and um, you know, and other Europeans will be saying, um, you know, is to talk about the Middle East peace process and the importance of, um, of giving that an early priority uh, in, the, uh, in the activities of the, of the next president and the next administration. Thank you. We have a hand line and a body line. Uh, so may I, uh, after, uh, after you, you speak, I will ask you to come there and then uh, you, sir. Let, let, okay. Um, Is it my turn now? Uh, first, he, she, uh, Madam will speak, and then you will speak, and then. Okay. <clears throat> right. Hello, thank you very much for coming. My name is Dr. Polner. I teach at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. So I think the tragedy of so much of this is the fact that Osama bin Laden is from a billionaire's family and that the bulk of his money has been spent on hate and helping to oppress his own people as opposed to liberating them. I think that the emphasis should be changed and it should be the Muslim countries that are pouring money into educating their people, especially their women, changing the roles of madrasas where students learn nothing but the Quran and so come out totally uneducated. Their population growth is just burgeoning and will continue to do so, so that there is nothing that the United States or Britain or anyone else could possibly do to ever bring these countries out of their desperate poverty. I could go on and on, I'm used to lecturing, but my question to you is a great concern to me fact that uh, biological and chemical weapons, how can we possibly stop biological or, chem or chemical weapons or both coming into either the United States or Britain? Thank you. Okay. 
Well, <laughs> um, oh, and I'd just like to add <laughs> one other thing is this is microscopic gaze on Israel that somehow if Israel stops the problems with the Palestinians, everything will go away. Well, the basic reality is all of these countries oppress their own people. That has absolutely nothing to do with Israel and the Palestinians, which are basically the fall guy for all of this. Okay, well, there were, th there were three things. I, I, I'll answer your question, which wasn't a question at the beginning, um, which, was, um, which was about education and whether Arab countries and other Muslim countries could do more. And I'm quite sure you're right that they could. I mean, I would take, if I look at the, the world over the next five, ten years, um, uh, I don't think it's just because I'm British. I would see Pakistan as one of the, the litmus tests of whether um, we're going to have um, a successful and more stable and more prosperous um, uh, Middle East and, uh, and uh, South Asia. Um, and I think that has to be a focus for your next administration, I'm sure it will be, uh, just as it's a focus for my government. So I would say, you know, that, use that as a, as a laboratory um, for seeing whether we can, uh, all of us, and that would include countries like Saudi Arabia and the other, and the other, um, um, the other Muslim countries with, uh, with, with budget surpluses at the moment, um, whether they can help too with some of the things that you were talking about. We are certainly spending uh, a good part of our aid money in Pakistan on educational reform, for precisely the reason uh, that, you, uh, that you gave. Uh, and I think there's a desire to do that in, uh, in Pakistan as well, but not enough, not enough money to do it. We'd like to see countries like China uh, helping more with, the, with that positive <laughs> of, um, of, Pakistan, of the Pakistani economy and, uh, and society. So I think you're, you're basically right that we should be, we should be doing more on that. On, on CBRN, um, you know, um, uh, I can't give you a wholly reassuring answer because we know from we know from, um, from websites, from the information which we've all got, that this is an area which um, which terrorists around the world would like to be successful in. They'd like to acquire uh, this type of um, this type of um, uh, equipment and, uh, and technology, um, and the means of opposing it are the same means as you use for uh, all of this. It's uh, it's intelligence. <coughs> Uh, it's uh, preempt it's uh, preempting uh, attacks. It's intelligence and um, and uh, um, political cooperation between between countries, uh, and that just has to continue. There's no I don't have a anything other to suggest to you than the, the normal techniques for handling um, individuals and organisations which are trying to uh, um, trying to do harm in uh, in that way. And the last thing is it's not it's not um, I, I, what I was saying wasn't putting all the pressure uh, uh, on Israel. Um, um, the, U the UK's perspective on this has always been one where we have seen the need for a, a balanced outcome which satisfies the key Israeli and also the key Palestinian requirements. And there are many rights and wrongs uh, on both sides. Um, but it, it does remain uh, a fact, um, certainly as far as I can see, and having, having talked to, uh, to Muslims in the UK, that whether it's um, whether it's fair or not, the fact is that this is, this is the issue which uh, concerns people and, um, and causes them uh, a, good, a good deal of, um, of vexation and worry, maybe even more than the situation in Iraq. Maybe that's puzzling, and you might say it's unfounded or unjustified. I'm just saying that my impression of a, Muslim, a fairly developed Muslim community such as in the UK is that that's the case. Um, and I think there are a number of ways in which we can try to mitigate that, part of which is better, is better dialogue and better explanation of what we're actually doing, which is, which is balanced uh, and responsible uh, and active. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yes, and then when you get in line afterward, yes, thank you. Go ahead. In my view, we must recognize the reality of definition differences of critical terms that we employ, a number of which we've already employed uh, in, in, in this lecture. Uh, because the, the need of, of a precise concurrence as to what something means is a matter that must be of serious concern to all governments. Certainly, I would imagine the British government is concerned to, to uh, be able to make it unmistakably clear what does it mean by terrorism because such terms appear in writing 
and they may have legal constitutional implications. Uh, and it is very easy for many of us to feel that, well, we all fit under a certain umbrella as far as uh, But is something terrorism? Is something militancy? Is something extremism? Uh, is something animosity? Uh, measures that the government must take in order to protect its interests and the interests of the people very much revolve about what is the what is the demonstration that must be presented to show that that is precisely what we're talking about this is terrorism and terrorism has been codified to have certain implications as far as the, the laws of Britain are uh, concerned. And speaking of the British government, uh, I would like to know a little bit about whether, uh, is there a problem for the British government? As I'm sure it's, there's a problem for the United States government sometimes carry to quite a uh, uh, in, in having to interpret carefully uh, how they, they define a problem, a behavior, an attitude, a perception, and therefore have to act in accordance with such concurrence. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Well, I'm, uh, I'm sorry if I was a bit vague. Um, I didn't mean to be. I was trying to choose my words carefully. Um, and I... I the, the terms you use all have different meanings for me. Terrorism, uh, militancy, extremism, um, they're, they're all words with different meanings, and I, I don't think I use the, all those words, but, I, um, but we could have a discussion, if you'd like, about the differences between them. I certainly think they're, they're different. Um, equally, it's sometimes quite difficult to get a recognized international definition of some of these terms. I know that in the United Nations, for a very, very long time, um, uh, for decades, I think, we've tried to get an internationally recognized definition of terrorism. Mm -hmm. I don't think we've succeeded even now, despite the fact that since 9-11 there's much more uh, UN, uh, more UN resolutions and uh, uh, more agreement maybe um, than, uh, than, than before. Um, I go back to a simple definition of, of terrorism, which is the, you know, the use of violence for, for political reasons, for political ends. Um, but of course, that's the difference between terrorism on the one hand maybe and some of the other terms we're talking about. Which may, which may more involve a cast of mind um, uh, or, a, or a set of beliefs or even, or even a desire to propagate um, those, those beliefs, but not necessarily involve the resort to violence. So I suppose, you know, I understand your point about the distinction between those, those terms, and undoubtedly it's incumbent on governments to be clear about that because we have to codify it in our, in our laws and justify every word of it as it goes through Parliament. And certainly, as far as my government's concerned, we've had uh, many very, very difficult debates on these subjects going back over the last five years, where most recently the government had a, had a rebuff on this issue, on one of these issues to do with um, uh, the length of time you can hold people before, um, before making a charge, um, precisely because of some of, these, uh, some of these debates which go back to a debate about civil liberties. So I, I agree with your fundamental premise. I'm not, I'm not sure that um, maybe I think there's an underlying implication that we wouldn't agree about the, the substance of the, of the definitions. Okay. I, I, uh, let, we'll just, let's yeah, keep going. Just, just a, a <coughs> point. The reason I'm bringing this up is that I'm particularly interested in the, in the dilemmas that the British government in this case is confronted uh, in a variety of situations where people raise all sorts of objections mm -hmm. and you have to respond in some fashion. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, uh, the, the example I just gave would be a good, a good recent one. I mean, uh, our, our police, um, after the uh, experience of the uh, terrorist attacks that we had uh, in London in 2005 and again in 2007, um, thought that they needed an additional power to be able to hold people for longer mm -hmm. Um, so that they could try to get more information from them uh, in, uh, in police questioning. Mm -hmm. um, and we did raise it from, I think, 14 to 28 days mm -hmm. um, at a certain point, after a huge debate. 
Then the government wanted to increase it to 42 days, mm -hmm. um, and that has not proved possible. There's been too much parliamentary mm -hmm. uh, opposition mm -hmm. to it. The government could have used swinging measures in parliament to, um, to sort of get round the parliamentary differences mm -hmm. there. We chose not to do that, to accept that it's just very difficult mm -hmm. to achieve it. So that would be a good example of something where a civil liberties argument confronted a, an expert view from our police that they needed, that they needed this for the future. Because they said, such is the complexity of, of uh, counter-terrorism cases, where you are having to sift through, maybe um, uh, literally <coughs> sift through physically, the forensic evidence of a bomb blast or something like that on the one hand, combined with the telephone records of the people who are uh, under suspicion, uh, and, and, un and try and understand a network of individuals' contacts, that can take a very long time. And in the police's view, you know, longer than the... Uh, the 28 days, which is on the statute book at the moment, um, that's less a less an issue of mm -hmm. defining terms than of than of a, a, a debate about what is proportionate um, and and reasonable, um, given the balance that you need to strike between civil liberties and, and security. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kunio Waki, and I'm at the East Asia Institute here to understand the more international security issue. Uh, U.S. media kind of gives us the impression that the uh, uh, U.K. is a little bit critical about the militaristic approach uh, taken in counter-terrorist uh, measure, and you may be advocating more soft, comprehensive approach. But uh, in view of the fact that the often U.K. provides leadership in Europe for various international collaboration, uh, do you have some strategic sort of uh, uh, Think in which you are trying to communicate uh, other countries mm -hmm. so that collaboration can become more effective, <coughs> or even NATO operation in Pakistan or Afghanistan, uh, there have to be better strategy or coherence. And uh, uh, as ambassador, also, do you advocate certain things in view of the fact that, that the new administration will be in power in the US? Thank you. Interesting question. Yeah. Um, um, there are certain things in the way that the U.S. has conducted um, uh, affairs since 9/11 that we um, that we don't agree with. I mean, we said uh, repeatedly, really from very early on, um, that we didn't agree with uh, Guantanamo. We, th we thought Guantanamo should close, uh, and we thought Guantanamo had a, a disturbing uh, impact around the world. So we've, you know, there are aspects of what has gone on since 9/11 which we which we voiced the public. Um, concern about. Um, but for the most part, as you know, and, um, and despite political controversy at home, the UK has been an extraordinary supporter and ally of the United States. I mean, we, we still have over 4,000 troops in Iraq. We have 8,000 troops in Afghanistan, which is the, by far the largest after the United States of any, uh, of any, uh, of any country. Um, and uh, because we are um, uh, very active internationally uh, and take a lead internationally, um, we probably do as much as anyone, um, probably more than most, doing the things you were talking about, which is trying to get very effective international action uh, against this. And we would go across the spectrum, the hard end and the soft end. We do both and everything in between um, and have to, you know, from special forces all the way through to what you were talking about in terms of, in terms of soft power. I'll give you an example. Um, actually from a job I did myself, I was ambassador, British ambassador to the European Union uh, when 9-11 happened. Uh, and we led the way in the European Union in trying to fashion an effective European response. And one of the things that we agreed was not, not without controversy, I'm calling it a European arrest warrant, which makes it very, very much easier within Europe to extradite somebody who's accused of a, of a serious offense from one country to another. It means you don't have to conduct, conduct a mini trial uh, in, in, uh, in Italy uh, mm -hmm. if you want to return somebody who's wanted on a substantive charge in Germany or in, or in Spain or in the UK. Because we basically trust each other's judicial systems in the European Union, we're able to say if, if the police in, uh, in, uh, in, um, uh, in Sweden want so-and-so and you've got a sort of prima facie um, uh, case, then that person should very swiftly be returned and they should face the substance of the case in the country which, uh, which wants them. And that's helped enormously. And we were able to make, take advantage of it two years ago 
when we managed to get uh, the extradition from, uh, from Italy of one of the people who was involved in the uh, terrorist cases in, uh, in London in July of 2005. So that's an example of something which the UK has done, uh, has done in practice. But certainly in Afghanistan, which with Pakistan I would say is one of the, the test cases for international cooperation in the next few years, um, what the UK would like to see is much more sharing of the burden, uh, much more effective um, sharing of the burden militarily, but also economically. Um, you know, and in dealing, for example, with some of these terrible endemic problems like such as counter-narcotics, where we have mm -hmm. uh, the international lead in dealing with counter-narcotics in Afghanistan, we need much more support from the international financial institutions and from others to try to, uh, to, try to uh, make progress on that. Now, that will take decades to get that right, but we need, we need over the next five or ten years to make a real start. Okay. Uh, what do you think of um, Jonathan Powell's assertion that we should be trying to cultivate um, some kind of back channel communication between um, terrorist groups, even like uh, Al Qaeda or the Taliban, and uh, the government, not necessarily to negotiate with them, but to have that open as, if mm -hmm. even when they actually got this specific demand, that that, that channel already exists? And uh, as a follow up, I suppose, is, is this something the British government is pursuing? Just, just between ourselves. Just between us. <laughs> I think. I think that um, just to, to, to step back for a moment. I mean, for, generally speaking, the, um, dealing with governments before we get on to terrorists uh, to, to organisations, um, the UK government generally has relations with other countries and will try to have a have a dialogue with their with their governments, and um, that's pretty much the, the rule that we have in the UK and with countries like Iran and Syria and North Korea. We have diplomatic relations. It's not easy with them. Having those relationships, having that dialogue does not seem to us to be uh, a legitimation of their uh, behavior, but it's a way of trying to, to change their, their behavior, uh, usually over time. You can't expect it to happen, to happen instantly. Now, with terrorist groups, it's more instant, it, it, it's, it is much more, much more difficult. Um, but, uh, and you probably have to um, avoid making um, sweeping generalizations when you deal with that. Um, because um, you know, very often um, you know, there are um, contacts at some point. For example, with the IRA, um, the, um, the peace process began with um, back channel contacts with the, uh, with the IRA many, many years before there was an effective um, political process. So these things do happen. I think it's extremely difficult to imagine that happening with Al-Qaeda, uh, mainly because, the, um, uh, as I was trying to say in my, in my, in my um, <coughs> remarks, um, there is no political program which uh, a government could sort of latch onto. Um, it's really mayhem and, uh, and confrontation that is the core of the Al-Qaeda ideology. And it's very, very difficult to see quite how you would um, you know how you would you know, begin begin uh, a discussion with them, even setting aside the, the nature of the crimes that they're uh, responsible for. So I don't I don't myself see that as a as a desirable or practical proposition um, um, uh, at all. But with the Taliban, um, you know, I, we have said actually, and, and your government said, and the uh, Afghan government has said, and recently the Pakistani government said, we've all said that we need uh, a dialogue but not one which is easy for them, but one which actually says to the Taliban, if you're prepared to renounce violence, if you're prepared you know, essentially to accept, um, accept that, um, uh, that you're not going to be attacking the, uh, the Afghan nation and the Afghan state, um, then there's a basis on which we can go for reconciliation. And I think you know, that this has got to be one strand in Afghanistan. It's got to be to try to pull some of the uh, less extreme more reconcilable elements in within the, the Taliban, which is a very loose, loose network. It's not a. Mm -hmm. It's not just. A, it's not. A, it's not monolithic. To try and pull people away, because that's ultimately the only way you deal with insurgencies. Is to pull people away to reduce the the core to a very very small number. Who are going to take years or decades to um, to be reconciled themselves? But you basically pull away the props of their support. So I think that is what's got to happen over the next few years in Afghanistan. I think it's now increasingly the view in this country, I was reading an article about it earlier today, one of the New York Times, uh, about precisely that. Um, how you do it has got to, it's got to be done in a way which doesn't then pull the rug from under the feet of Democrats, 
and uh, people within that country who sacrificed a lot to put in place proper structures and representational structures. So you need to do it you know, in conjunction with the authorities and with the government and with the tribal leaders. But I do think that's important. But I, I can't see it with Al-Qaeda, I'm afraid. Yes. Hi. Um, I was wondering, how do you see the British government um, having engaged its domestic um, Muslim population, especially after the past couple of terrorism incidents? And how would you characterize the difference between the British Muslim population and the American Muslim population? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I, I'll start with the second part of your question. I mean, there are some very, very big differences. I'll give you three sets of figures. I, I, I thought it was going to come up. So um, in the UK, we have about 1.6 million uh, Muslims out of a population of 60 million. So that's 2.7% of, of, the, of the population. Here, uh, the statistics seem a little bit less clear, but it's, it's between 0.6 and 1% of the population. That is... 1.8 and 3 million people, so it's a big, that's a big span. Um, and in France, just to give you another example, at the other end of the spectrum, it's between 7 and 10 percent of the population, so um, mm. up to you know, 6.4 million mm. people, so very much larger Muslim community in France. So we're, we're considerably, um, proportionately larger than, um, larger than the United States. I think there is just going around this country and knowing a bit about Muslim communities in the UK, there are quite big socioeconomic differences. Uh, in the Muslim community in the UK is by and large, and always generalizing on this, but mm -hmm. by and large it's poorer mm -hmm. uh, than the Indian community, for example, Indian origin community in the UK. It's much poorer than the um, Pakistan origin, uh, Muslim origin communities mm -hmm. uh, here in the United States, mm -hmm. where, um, you know, by and large, there's been much more rapid and successful um, economic integration and, and uh, community integration than in the UK. You tend to see, particularly in the urban, in the urban areas, uh, you know, much more of the uh, Muslim communities congregating together, much less dispersal um, and much less uh, upward mobility. So there are some differences, which I think in, in turn affect the, uh, the difficulties that we, that we face um, and the challenges we face from these communities. Okay. Um, um, so in thinking the way you uh, described uh, global anti-terror focus in one uh, with the Muslim network, but my focus uh, would be on state-sponsored terror, uh, particularly the case uh, with Litvinenko, in London, uh, Blitkovska in Moscow, which uh, Blitkovska is more or less uh, unclear who is perpetrators. There might be Chechen, there might be still the HD. This is the Nenka case, it's obvious right now that it's uh, behind the scenes, it's uh, security services of Russia. And the previous case uh, had been uh, also in London uh, by um, the killing of Marker. Yes, BBC correspondent, and it was Bulgarian state police and uh, uh, provided the poison by the Russian KGB, as well as the Soviet KGB. And General, who was involved in that, is, by the way, here in uh, this event, KGB office or General. So the question really, how are you dealing with that? What's the status of the affairs? You know, I know that the intelligence was good and the uh, state of, you know, uh, that you might uh, now decide not to pursue this case? Well, we've done the opposite. I mean, we, we, we treated the uh, dreadful murder of uh, Mr. Litvinenko um, as a murder. Um, and uh, we treated it as a criminal case and a very important criminal case. And uh, our um, prosecuting authorities reached uh, the view that there was a case to answer uh, by a Russian citizen, uh, um, Mr. Lugovoy, and um, we, but he's now uh, state senator. I, under I, under yeah. I understand that. But um, so it's sort of what I'm referring to, because you describe a perfect global anti-terror campaign where it exists here, uh, to my mind, at least on the basis of the knowledge that we all have, it's state-sponsored terrorism well, coming from Russia. No, I'm, well, you, you, you've made that <laughs> statement, but uh, I don't know whether it was or wasn't. And we, we could have a debate about that and maybe a private conversation about it. Um, but um, that's not what exists on the warrant. What exists on the warrant is evidence um, that uh, this man 
uh, committed a really dreadful murder, um, you know, uh, literally on the streets of London. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, and okay, you say that he's now uh, a member of the a member of the Duma. That doesn't mean that we the case is closed. The case remains open. Uh, it and means Duma, if, if Duma he. Duma had a, uh, just uh, Duma, uh, you know, had a law that uh, definitely sponsored this kind of terror act. No, I know it, but uh, and we've and what we said to the Russian authorities at that time was that they should seriously consider actually changing that law, because what, what that law what that law does um, is it says that um, uh, that they will never extradite a Russian citizen to uh, another country. We regard that as, as backward, uh, at the best 19th century, um, and not the sort of thing which we regard as the right thing to do for a serious international partner. We think that. Um, countries should be prepared to extradite their nationals uh, if there's a good case against them. So that was the first um, wrong, you know, uh, regrettable move by, uh, by, the, by the Russian parliament to do that in the first place. But uh, I don't know what you do in a case like this. If they won't, this is not the only case around the world where someone hasn't been surrendered. This does happen. Um, you can't send in a crack squad to, to whisk him away. That, that's life. He's there. Let them just finish. Let them just finish my thought. Um, it doesn't come with impunity. Um, whatever happens to Mr. Lubavoy, um, he, won't, he won't very readily visit any country within the European Union. He won't very readily visit any country uh, which might extradite him to the UK because Interpol and, and our police network are on the case and are aware of it. And it's a, a, a source of huge regret to us that they wouldn't, uh, the Russian authorities wouldn't surrender him. Um, but ultimately, ultimately uh, I'm not, not sure what else what else you can do. Okay, um, let, let's see if anybody else knew one. Yes, question here. Wrap. Yeah, wrap yeah. Yes. Hi. <laughs> How, if at all, have recent events between Russia and Georgia um, impacted um, kind of tells and sharing between Russia and uh, the rest of the European Union? Uh, or rather, excuse me, European Union. Hmm. Uh, I don't know um, the answer to that. I mean, there, there wasn't a huge amount of intelligence. There, 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 was, some, there was some on, on, terror, on terrorism, a limited amount of cooperation on, uh, on terrorism. Um, uh, in our case, that was, that's been complicated for a number of years, and the Litvinenko case undoubtedly complicated it further. But, um, um, but um, I wouldn't have thought that cooperation with Russia overall will have been eliminated by... Um, uh, by that, for example, on police networks or, or, or whatever. But for the UK, that was what, they, what the Russians did in Georgia was a very serious matter. Um, but equally, um, our belief is the, right, is that the right course in dealing with it is to maintain our channels of communication uh, to Russia, um, certainly to use uh, legitimate points of pressure, such as if we we're able to um, to uh, reduce our energy dependence on Russia as a European Union, that would in turn reduce their leverage uh, over us. So things like that, which makes sense anyway, we should we should look at more intensively than perhaps than we have uh, than we have in the past. But we don't believe that the answer is to you know to burn burn the bridges um, and to try to uh, exclude Russia because I mean, whether you're dealing with uh, Iran or. Um, or the world energy crisis, or the Middle East peace process, or even, or even capital, global capital flows, where there's a certain amount of Russian money going around the world at the moment. Uh, it, it's better to have their, their support and their cooperation than to, than to have a, um, a, a, a sort of a, an incomprehending and a hostile Russian response. So I think we just have to work at it and test whether it's possible to relaunch some sort of strategic understanding uh, with Russia over the next few years um, with a new administration here, which I hope will help. Uh, we have to close now. I think the, range, the rich range of questions gives some sense of the, the multiple levels, thought-provoking pro nature of this uh, talk, this position. We're going to be posting the talk on the School of International Public Affairs website, and we hope there will be a lot of feedback, and we do hope for other positions uh, that in, in the next uh, couple of years that you'll come back to Columbia. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, much indeed.